On this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast, Crushing IRS Debt. So welcome back to this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast. My name is Sean Yesner, owner and founder of Yesner Law, and we are uh, joined again by our co-host, George Corbello. Welcome, George. How you doing? I am still remote and lost in New York. I have to say, though, I, I'm ready to come back to Tampa. I am... I'm definitely officially done with traffic in New York City. It's been uh, so I don't know if you guys again, when this was recording, there was a huge crane accident that happened in New York City where there was a fire and, you know, the the crane like the wire itself broke off. I was literally in Hell's Kitchen when all of that was happening and it was (laughs) the traffic and the amount of not moving was really, really fun. So I just want to recommend to everybody itself. Uh, yeah, traffic in New York City is no good. <laughs> well, we won't we won't compare traffic stories. I think I think you win, but we yeah, won't yeah, yeah, compare please. Yeah, good. <laughs> traffic stories. Um, we're also so yeah. As we're recording this, we're in the last couple of days of the no spend challenge. Although, yes. um, as when it comes out, the no spend challenge will be over. We mm-hmm. did we did get a comment uh, about uh, from Amanda about. Um, you know, when, when can we do it again? When are we going to do it again? And, and saying, you know, we, I want to do it this month or that month because I've got this coming up and that coming up. And, and it actually prompted a couple of things, uh, in response from me, which was, well, number one, yeah, we'll probably do it again. Uh, yeah. but number two, you don't necessarily need us to do it. The whole point yeah. of the challenge was the accountability piece of it, but you don't necessarily need us. If you want to do your own no spend challenge, go for it. If you want to do it and you want to tell us about it and maybe one or both of us, or we'll get all the listeners to jump on. But the other piece to it, you know, she, Amanda was saying, you know, I don't want to do it during this month or that month because of birthday parties or because of this or because of that. Right. And I said, well, look, the, the point of the no spend challenge is not that you're not spending money. It's better ways to spend money. So if you're planning a birthday party for somebody, but we happen to be in the in the no spend challenge, well, instead of spending you know thousands of dollars to rent out a, a bounce house, why don't you get a bunch of Nerf guns and go to the park? You know, there. In other words, there are other ways. Be creative, right? Yep. We were talking about that last week. Needs versus wants. Yep. So there's other ways to do it. So, um, but yeah, definitely, I think we'll do it again. I, 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 it's been fun. The one thing I've been very creative here in New York has been, yeah, wrong month to go on a no spend challenge is to go to New York and uh, be in a hotel and and be visiting family and all that, where you want to spend money and and debt. So okay, that that was hard enough there. Um, also, the other thing too is tolls. Like I thought tolls were a lot cheaper. <laughs> And realizing when I looked at the statement for these tolls themselves, it was like, holy cow, it's seven dollars to get through this. You know, a few dollars from that perspective. That's been the uh, the interesting part. So, yeah, just pay attention to some of the spending, too. That that was so I did save a little bit more money because I was started to avoid all of these these tolls just to make sure I'm not giving away too much to the city. There you go. Well, and you know, again, it's all about finding ways to save, to save some money. So, uh, I think we'll we'll tally it up. Maybe we'll do kind of a wrap up episode here coming up. We'll we'll tally up the results. But we have a guest who has been patiently waiting while you and I uh, banter back and forth. So I want to get to our guest this week. It. Yeah, no, and 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 maybe we'll let you know. So George and I did. A, and, and a couple of our listeners did uh, a no spend challenge. So during the month of July, we could only spend on things that were necessities. Um, and if we chose not to spend something, we put that away in savings. And so we saw how much we would save up over the course of a month by, you know, not buying things. And uh, I think I've got, I haven't calculated it, but I've got a, a little bit over a hundred bucks. Uh, saved up that I didn't spend. So yeah, I need to I need to re reevaluate. But we'll do the uh, we'll do the recap in the in, in the next episode just to make sure where we're at. But yes, I I, I would agree with you there. I'm probably <laughs> again with the tolls. I started avoiding them. You know, they they start adding up pretty quick. But I, I you know definitely over two hundred for sure. Yeah, for me it was not uh, the the biggest thing for me was not bringing not buying lunch at the office, but bringing lunch in with me every day, and that helped me save a whole bunch of money. But I want to read uh, your bio um, directly from your website because 
it, it's kind of an interesting story and, and one that, that I relate to uh, as a fellow attorney. So uh, our guest is a world traveler, mother, number lover, and a great attorney. <laughs> While admittedly not that humble, she's proud to be a caring friend to her clients. Even though a lo love of numbers runs in her family, she had grandparents who were accountants. Uh, she had always shied away from a career related in any way to finance. So one summer, she landed an internship working for a criminal judge in Miami. Quickly realizing that she did not want to practice criminal law, uh, that judge sent her to different divisions to observe other judges. The week she spent in probate court changed her life. She finally learned what she wanted to do with the rest of her professional life. She wanted to become a probate attorney. So that fall, she shared her plan with one of her professors. He advised that she take a tax course a recommendation that she reluctantly followed, but na but studying tax law was like being in nirvana. So her love affair with tax law began from that moment, and she is currently a tax attorney. And so welcome our guest, Claudia Moncars. Welcome, Thank Claudia. Thank you. Well, yeah, I am a certified tax geek. I own it at this point. Well, the reason I the reason that that bio in particular was interesting to me, you know, people say all the time, it kind of drives me crazy. Sometimes people say all the time, like my wife will say to me about our older son, he argues a lot, he's going to be a great attorney. And I'm like, well, number one, arguing doesn't mean you're going to be a great attorney. And number two, what we wanted to do earlier in our careers, I, I didn't want to be an attorney. When I was growing up, I thought I'd be a veterinarian. And then I saw oh, I was going to be an archaeologist. There you go. And, and I saw one of our dogs get a shot and I turned green. And at that point, my mom knew I was never going to be a vet. Um, you know, I went into law school. So my background is also in accounting. My dad is a CPA. I went into law school saying, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I, I went into law school saying I'm going to be a tax attorney. I wanted to be you when I went into law school. Oh. <laughs> I got bit by the litigation bug while I was in law school. And I said, I'm going to do moot court and I'm going to do trials and I'm going to litigate and I'm going to da, da, da. I got out of law school and I found a job with a real estate attorney and now I'm a dirt lawyer. So it, it's what struck me about your bio is what struck me about my own biography is that yeah. what we went into law school thinking we were going to do is not what we came out of law school doing. But yeah, uh, um, I was, I was an English lit major undergrad, so I really like writing. I really like oh, wow. reading. So uh, math was never my favorite. I, I did well, but it was never my favorite subject. But um, tax law is really not about numbers at the end of the day. So it's about being creative. So Well, and <laughs> when you talk about tax, when you talk about numbers, we got to bring up the IRS. Mm. Yes. I would agree with that. <laughs> so everybody's favorite topic. So... Um, I guess my my first kind of question for you is people get scared of the IRS, but I guess it's it's fairly simple to to figure it out. I mean, there there there's no reason to overreact to the IRS or but no, and, and I agree with you and I, I think it's part um you know, I always say power is knowledge. So I I appreciate you giving me this platform to talk to your listeners and your audience and to give them the knowledge because I think that takes the fear away once we know about it. And a couple of things. Yes, the IRS is a, at the end of the day, it's a collection agency. So it's just the biggest collection agency that we have in the uh, in the U.S., but they're a collection agency. And even one of their mission statements is, I'm paraphrasing, but collect the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time. They have it in a more like legal terms but we also have to remember that we as taxpayers have a bill of rights so there is actually like 10 points of a bill of rights that we have within the irs so they can use whatever they want to do so that's something that we also have to remember so they're scary i guess even i have to i get the letters every time but when i get one with my personal name on it i even pause for a second or two but we all make mistakes i made mistakes with the irs so and I do this for a living, so. Yeah, I I remember okay. I remember one payroll um, about a month after I I submitted my payroll taxes late to the IRS. The the law firm submitted mm -hmm. payroll taxes yeah. late to the IRS, and I got a I got that letter in the mail, and I went, oh my gosh, it's from the mm -hmm. IRS. 
Uh, and I opened it up and I went, okay, what am I going to have to pay them in penalties and interest and blah, 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 blah. And basically the letter from the IRS said, this is the first time you've ever made that mistake. Um, you know, the error is a relatively small error. You did pay it. You just paid it a little bit late. So this one, don't worry about, we're not going to, we're not going to bill you for anything. I mean, probably the interest and penalties would have amounted to more than what it cost them to send me the letter to begin with. So but still, that that fear, it ended up being nothing but that fear of getting the letter that says IRS on it. And I went, oh, oh my gosh. So, uh, but you, most people, I guess what, what a lot of people worry about, my dad used to call it the audit lottery. And so yes. my dad was very above board. My dad was very, you know, by the book, here's the regulations, here's what we're going to do with your tax returns. But whenever some, I asked him a question that could have gone into the gray area a little bit, he said, well, you know, if you get audited, here's what's going to happen. If you don't get audited, then here's what's going to happen. So how how can you avoid being audited? What what are some things you can do that, that may raise flags with the IRS or wouldn't raise flags with the IRS? Well, I, I think that it will, like you said, I, I really think tax law is about being creative. So it's about getting, you know, it's not about evading taxes, but is about just paying your your first share, whatever you're required to do. And the the tax law lets us be a little creative, that gray area. And but it also has to be a personal decision, what you feel comfortable with. Uh, and also whatever you're gonna do, you need to have the backup, your documentation to say this is what happened, right? Um it so it's also about not like a common one that's right now a lot of there's a lot of audits actually going on is we all when we set up our business we hear that oh create an llc and then elect to be an s corporation right so that you end up paying less in taxes in in, in social security taxes because we pay more if we just if it's on our on our personal tax return but then everybody does the s corporation makes the election but they don't pay themselves a salary so <laughs> So that's where you, and, and you, if you're an S corporation, you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. So if you're a lawyer, for instance, you cannot pay yourself like $5,000 for the year and then the rest is tuition. That's not how it works, but that's what a lot of people end up doing. And the IRS has always said, we are going to audit you for this. We are going to audit this. And they finally started doing it this year. We're finally starting to see. So I guess the way that you, you try to avoid an audit is you first of all have good records keep records of anything you do especially something that is in that gray area that if you have the law but you just um maybe uh, another big thing that they audit a lot is um business uh, travel expenses because people tend to actually um deduct personal uh, like, uh travel so just make sure that you you keep track of what that you actually do now there's like all these apps that you can like track mileage you can um or you know um, I still have like a, an actual calendar, a hand calendar. So I'm a little bit old school. So <laughs> when I'm going to, that's something I actually write in my calendar. So, and then I have a bunch of calendars that I can just keep up when I, you know, if I, if I ever get audited, um, keep your, uh, you know, just, I think we all, I, isn't it like, uh, that same fix it fat, hox it slaughter. So, you know, when you're crossing that line and if you're, if it's in the gray area, keep your records and do whatever you feel comfortable. Don't get too much in. And then just, um, but I think, I still think that you can be a little, maybe I'm a little bit more risk, risky than your dad. I still think that you get to do a little planning in that gray area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. And he, he, like I said, he, he would tell people, here's the law, here's, this, here's what it says, here's, here's what the, the IRS code requires. But yeah, his, I remember him calling it the audit lottery. One of the things that he said, <clears throat> so I finally jumped on the cryptocurrency train a couple of years back and, and, you know, my, my, uh, hundred dollar, I think it ended up being like $200 investment in crypto has now is now worth like 20 bucks. So I'm doing great. Um, but I remember, I remember him saying <laughs> crypto is a huge audit red flag. And this was, this might've yes. been a couple of years ago, but he was saying crypto is a huge audit red flag. And, and actually, um, well, it's not five, six months ago now, close to a year, you know, that new funding that the IRS got, 
one of the things they said, and, and the actual law spells out what they're going to do. And one of those things is compliance um, with all digital uh, assets. They don't even call it digital currency. They call it digital assets. So they are, that's one of their target area. Like about 10 years ago, the, the pet project for the IRS was foreign accounts. All our foreign accounts that we had in other countries, they finally figured out that was a lot of money that people were not reporting. So now I see the trend as being their pet project, cryptocurrency. And, and I think the, the mistake that everybody makes is when you think cryptocurrency, oh, that's like cash, right? So we don't keep track really of cash, so it doesn't matter. So, or, I mean, we don't keep track of like how we spend the cash. So we, we spend a, a, we buy a, a, a pen, we buy a pen. So we don't, that's not a trade, but the IRS, because in, and it happened in this year's tax returns that they change it to digital assets. So that means they see it more like a stock. So like you change it. And a lot of, uh, and I think a lot of the, so, and it's not only digital assets, they're included NFT and all of those things. So mm -hmm. I think the big thing also with, with the IRS and what you're, that was saying that is big for audits is because once more, before it wasn't as regulated, people didn't really know that there was records for it. Just like there's records for your PayPal account, there's records for Sally, there's records for Venmo, and they are required to report to the IRS. A lot of these cryptocurrency, like uh, that, if they're in the US, they have to report to the IRS your transaction. So that's why it, it, it became a ground for audit. And they're focusing on that. Yeah, but like you said, it's, it's it's interesting because it's an asset. It's not currency. But mm -hmm. when you said it's a lot like stocks, so my stocks can go up, my stocks can go down. I don't necessarily have to report it to the IRS unless I sell one of those stocks and then I I I have a gain or I have a loss. That's when I would report it to the IRS. But I can let it go up and down and up and down and up and down as long as I want, as long as I don't sell it. Right? Yes, but the problem is that if you change from like uh, from Bitcoin to I, I to I mean Adros. I mean, there's different type of tokens. Right. So if you change from one to one, that's when you actually sold it at that point, and people don't think right. that. Or if you take it and you go, I got it. you pay legal, you pay legal fees with it. You think of it as cash that you just paid. Uh, you know, your you know someone's legal, someone paid chance legal fees with crypto, even though they are thinking that they just use cash. They really sold their stocks they sold their bitcoin got cash to pay you right and most people that's, i mean it is that's a currency i mean technically it is a currency itself but not Again, for tax not, not, not for, for the tax IRS. right not and for that's the IRS. where and i think that's where people get get confused in that it is to again digital currency but how it's treated by the IRS is very different. And I think that's what we want Correct. to, people get confused on that. Yeah. And I think and that's, that's gonna, I, yeah. I think the analogy, the analogy works. In other words, if, I, if I'm going to pay you with Bitcoin, the analogy would be if I were to pay you with stocks, well, I would have to liquidate those stocks Correct. and turn them into cash. And then I would take that cash and I would pay you. It's the same analogy. If you're using Bitcoin, you'd have to take those Bitcoins, turn them into cash pay me i'd then take that cash and buy the same amount of bitcoins it's just it's uh unless you unless you already you can do it in the system then then it's then then there's a different there's a different way to do that itself so yeah. i think that's the but other even if, even if you do it in the system you have to think like like it happened like you sold it and gave him and gave sean cash even though it, it that that that's that sell doesn't happen for purposes of tax, it does happen. Right. And that's where, again, a lot of people still, you know, wait, wait a second. That's not, I didn't do any of those, but to the eyes of the IRS, it's like, no, no, that's exactly what we see you in doing. Okay. That right. makes sense. Well, is, it, is there, is there a problem when we're, when we're saying I'm converting cash into Bitcoin? Is that something that's also, you know, looked at from an IRS perspective? We all know about the cashing out, but is, yeah. they just look at it as I'm investing you know, in Bitcoin yeah. or putting into it itself, just like IRS, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the IRAs and your 401ks, things like that. Yeah, but you want to keep a record of how much you put in because just like stock, I bought it today, I yeah. bought Apple for $100. So you want to know when you bought it for how much because depending on the, how long you hold it or how much you, you had a gain or a loss, that's important. So, and that's the other, but yeah, sometimes it's hard to track that. But now there's uh, there's apps and yeah. software for that. So 
you there's know, always I, an app for everything. <laughs> of you course. know what I what I wonder now that you mentioned that. So you, one of the things with stocks, as I understand, is if somebody passes away and I inherit those those stocks, I get what's called a, a stepped up basis. In other words, if correct if my grandfather brought, bought Apple at a hundred bucks and then when he died, it's worth 200 bucks. And he said in his will that I was going to inherit it. When I inherit it, my basis in that stock is now $200, what it's worth today. Right. And so if mm-hmm. I sell it, you know, a year from now and it's worth $300 where my grandfather would have had to realize a $200 gain, he bought it at 100, it was worth 300 because I inherited it. Um, I only have a one hundred dollar gain from two hundred to three hundred. I wonder if I don't know if crypto can be in. I guess crypto could be inherited, and I wonder if the IRS is going to apply those same stepped up basis rules to crypto. Um, I haven't I haven't looked at that one in particular, but if we use the ba- the the all the basic rules tax law it would apply too it should get a step up in basis and if you have way too much i mean you're there will be a state will be paying a state tax yeah but i mean i guess so we're talking about crushing debt and we're talking about crushing irs debt so all these topics are you know i kind of geek out at at accounting and crypto and all that kind of stuff too but what happens if and i get these calls from time to time but what happens if somebody owes money to the irs what should they do well i think um here, I'm gonna. I, I always joke that I'm a half woo woo lawyer because I, I think um, I have half woo. And I think the first step really is to kind of um, going back to this whole like we all make mistakes. So I think the first step is you kind of have to forgive yourself because I, I keep on having recurring clients, and I think if they don't even deal with that part, they're they're they just like own it that they made a mistake and it's okay. I mean, every year there's an average of eight million new collection cases in the IRS. And that's just the ones that they get a hold of. So wow. there's a lot of people that that do this. So it's between, like I said, seven to 8 million uh, every year. So first, you know, forgive yourself, then actually open those letters that you get from the IRS, because most people don't open them. I have clients that come with a stack of letters. And, and the reason why you want to open them is because, like we said, we all have bill of rights. So you have to open them to see because you have um, appeals rights you have um, they give you a lot of warnings they give you a lot of time so you you want to they have a set procedure by statute that they have to follow so you want to use that that system that process to your benefit but you can only use it if you open those letters right. and actually know how much you owe you know get a feeling for what you owe and then once you know that you make sure that you're current and compliant you actually ha- are up to date in all your tax returns or that you have to file. And then there's a, I can come up with 10 strategies from the top of my head that you can usually do. You can kind of negotiate with the IRS. You just kind of have to know your finances. And that's why I was excited about the challenge because you kind of have to know where you are with your finances and all that. And, um, and then you just go and engage the IRS. But the worst thing to do is there's two things that you shouldn't do. One, put your head in the sand try to avoid them. They're going to eventually catch you up with you one way or another. They take a long time, but they have uh, they have about 10 years to collect. So they'll catch Whoa. up to you. And two, um, the other thing that you want to do is, uh, don't want to do is call them randomly. You have to have a strategy before you call them. You have to know what you can, what you're going to do up against your tax debt. Because like I said, pick up the phone after you're on the phone for like four or five hours. Um, and they will tell you that, I mean, they're not there to advocate for you. So they won't tell you what is the best thing for you. They are a collection agency at the end of the day. They are, and we already talked about their mission statement, collect the most amount of money in the least amount of time. So you have to come with a strategy. And that's engaging a good lawyer in some cases. Like when, when would I, you know, if I'm a small business owner, and maybe I've gotten it. When when is it the right time to engage a lawyer? You know, is it too deep of a hole, too big of an amount? I miss many deadlines. Like, what's what's the trigger that says I probably need help to be able to get through this situation? Um, you know, we have clients from like when they got that first letter all the way when they are just uh, we need to file something in tax court within a few days, so we get them all over the place. <laughs> okay. So you can do. But like I said, the part of it is um, you also get to some tax planning, you know, in it. 
you know, because everything with the IRS is a formula and how much you have to pay is a formula, whether you can negotiate is a formula, kind of like bankruptcy is very like a, a lot of formulas. So, but that's where I, I call it the magic, where the creativity comes in that gray area. We can help you plan with that formula. Sometimes, you know, we wait a, you know, like I said, the IRS 10 years to collect. So maybe if you're like less than a year and it's about to fall off, then we, we do some planning for you. So I think you can hire an attorney since day one just to check to see if there's any planning you can do to reduce that tax debt. So oh, and the one the other thing too, oh Sean, one more one more thing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, you, go ahead. You, all you lawyers get into into this thing and you, <laughs> you leave the code. No, but how long should I be keeping the record? So you mentioned they can come back 10 years in regards to those type of returns. Should I be, you know, as a small business owner, as a person, should I have my records for 10 years, put them either digitally and or again receipts itself, just have them ready just in case seven years from now I, you know, I get a letter or or hey, we 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 got you for this year, that yada yada. What's what's the recommendation there? Well, the 10 years is how long they have to collect once they say that you owe them money. Okay. Um, but they usually, um, they are about always running about two years behind. So okay. on, on, their, on their reviews of tax returns, so for instance, this year, but with COVID, they're actually like three years behind. So this year, they may be reviewing three years back. Um, like about seven, seven years. That's okay. a good, but yeah. And, but now everything's digital, so mm -hmm. it's not a hard. And the actual returns that you file, you may want to keep them for a little bit longer, just because um, we, um, you may actually need them for some tax. One time we actually had to go to an all return to get the basis for some stocks <laughs> that gotcha. somebody inherited. That's it, <laughs> some property. So so the actual tax return, you might just want to keep them for. I thought that I, return. I thought that I remembered that it's a six year statute of limitations. But that six, I, if I'm right, that six years from from filing the return. So it's not like you can ignore paying the taxes and say, <laughs> well, I, I owed tax oh. six years ago, but I didn't file the return. Statute of limitations is a run. No, if if you oh, haven't please. filed your return, the statute of limitations doesn't start yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's actually it's, uh, it's 10 years from when. Uh, yes. When you when the the taxes are oh and. Yes, when you file the return, that that time doesn't start the clock unless you start the return. Do you do any bankruptcy work? I don't, I don't. But but I always, oh, by the way, please always tell your bankruptcy lawyer that you are in tax court <laughs> or vice versa. Tell your tax attorney <laughs> that you're about to go into bankruptcy. Because <laughs> I know, I, I mean, that's, right now. do you do, can you do the analysis in terms of, because I know that that whether a tax debt is dischargeable or not, there's a certain analysis there. Can you do that analysis? Yes. Okay. Well, cool. I may be able to. Yes. Yes, we do that. I may have a couple yes, of clients yes. I want you to take a look at. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Nice. The... Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, please always, and to your listeners, tell your bankruptcy attorney that you have a tax attorney with the IRS and vice versa. Because I have... Uh, so oh, one, I, we have to go back to tax court for that. One, one thing I wanted to go back to, you said seven to eight million. Is that seven to eight million dollars that are in collection or seven to eight no. million people that owe? Cases. Cases. People. Wow. I didn't and know. And that. that's just the that's people a lot. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's just, so that's why, I, I mean, we all make mistakes, you know, we all have, we, we all do things that, that in our, in our, in our, I mean, they're not that easy to, I mean, they're in plain English, but they're not easy to understand. So, and, and the tax code is huge. So, so we can miss something. So yeah, there's about seven to 8 million new cases every year wow. that the IRS opens. Wow. Well, I, wanna... that, I mean, they don't process, but that's at the end of the day. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give out your, your contact information really quick. The website is uh, Moncar's Law, which is M-O-N-C-A-R-Z-L-A-W.com. Uh, on LinkedIn, you're Claudia Moncar's. And on YouTube, you are Ask the Tax Attorney. I think that's, that's awesome. Uh, so you can find Claudia uh, on her website, on LinkedIn, on YouTube. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about real quick was uh, poking around your website, the uh, the my tax alarm um, 
I guess, subscription that you have. And that yeah. is, it's, it's literally like credit monitoring, but for taxes instead of for credit. Is that, am I getting it right? Yeah, so just like we have that there's my FICO that you sign up to, you know, monitor your credit if you want to buy a house or you're worrying about your credit uh, score. We all have a tax record, right? The IRS has a record that we don't see it, but they have a record of everything they do. And there's a different little codes. And they, what they're going to do today, they put it immediately in a record. But the government, the government and being slow and inefficient, um, they won't send you that letter, for instance, that that letter that you received uh, for your payroll that went into their tax record right away, and you didn't see it probably until. Um, it took a couple of months to get. Yeah, you, yeah, you didn't. You, they they didn't send it out of that building for like two weeks, probably at the very minimum, because that's how government works. But we can find out because we we monitor our clients' records every day. We actually started this because we did it for our, our, our tax resolution clients who monitor every day. And then we can know when you're about to get that letter because there's certain codes that they put in there when they pull your return. So we know when you're about to get uh, audited too. There's a code that when that your return is for examination or if you do you actually owe money, we know when you're about to get the notice that they're gonna levy your account, they're going to put a lien on your property and the good thing is because we have like about like a two week window at the very least, then we can tell you ahead of time what's going to happen. And once more, that takes the fear away. That takes all that, you know, because then you have a game plan, then you know what's going to happen. And then, oh, and that letter is there. You get that letter. I already was going to do and I'm already fixing it. Right. That's nice. That's awesome. So, so yeah. people and, yeah. and I was looking, people can sign up for it. They go to the Moncars yep. Law website. Then there's a link on the website that says my tax alarm. You click on that link and then all the information is in there. So um, that's. And you uh, can also go to www.mytaxalarm.com. Okay. Yep. Or you can go. It just went directly. directly to I found it easily from a, a Google search as well. So that, that makes yeah. sense. Now, what the thing is you guys have now, is there anything that you need to provide, you know, into the service itself? Or is it just, I sign up, here's my social and you guys can start monitoring, you know, once, once the, uh, the payment goes through. Um, yeah, we, you have to sign a, you have to sign a power attorney, but that's just the document mm -hmm. we need to the, to provide to the IRS that you're authorizing us to, uh, look at your records. And like I said, every morning we pull it. So we pull and we see a sec and then we let, uh, we let you know if there's any letter or by the way, um, and it works for, I mean, for, for clients that are in payment plans and things like that, um, because if you don't keep your payment plan with the IRS, then you're default and then they terminate it and you're back to square one. So sometimes we also let them know, oh, by the way, you miss a payment plan. You miss a payment it. this month. Don't miss the next one or pay right now. Right. So yeah, it, it, it's worked out really good and really excited because it takes a, takes a lot of the, uh, the surprise, the gotcha right. from the IRS. Right. But like you say, we, we were talking before, you just use their inefficiency to your benefit. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, as we kind of get to the end of today's episode, is there anything we, we missed? Anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I, I think like, uh, once more, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I, I know like the IRS is scary and it is um, getting those letters is a little bit, but um, just is a little bit just that uh, I think opening those letters and just take action. Just like your your listeners taking actions in their challenges, just take action when it comes to the IRS that just, just do something about it. Even opening a letter today, that's better than doing nothing. So, yeah. so do take some action and just, you can crush it too. Right. Absolutely. Be intentional, right? Get it. Pay, pay yeah. and pay them on time. There you <laughs> if go. You do yeah. all right. <laughs> pay them on time. That's uh that's another, I've had a few, few clients who are like, yeah, I'm paying, yeah. you know, they have the payment plans and things like that. It's just pay, pay, pay them on time and pay them as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So again, real quick, yes. the website is moncarslaw.com. Uh, LinkedIn is Claudia Moncars. Uh, YouTube is Ask the Tax Attorney. Uh, or you can go to mytaxalarm.com. So um, thank you, Claudia. We appreciate you being a guest on this week's show. Yes. I uh, Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you guys. Yeah. So a um, couple other things before we wrap up really quick. We've got the... Um, the uh, Patreon page, you can go there, you can support the show. Uh, we 
I, I promise we will get editing here back up and running really, <laughs> really soon. I promise. You sound amazing, Sean. Don't worry. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Luckily, I don't know if we're going to post the YouTube with my hairy face, but... Um, <laughs> But but yeah, we'll get editing back up. But again, Patreon, that'll allow us to put some more money back in. Um, we do have a potential new sponsor for the show. Um, I've got some product in the refrigerator for you when you get back, George. Um, <laughs> I can't wait. For, I can't for wait. a potential new sponsor that we'll, we'll talk to you all about. But um, yeah, other than that, um, reach out. You can find George. You can find uh, Curbelo Financial, all of his social media pages, all the Yesner Law social media pages. Again, the Patreon page. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thanks again to Claudia for being a guest on this week's show. Definitely when you're dealing with the IRS, we want you to have more money at the end of the month than month at the end of the money. And we will talk to you in next week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast.